Hey everybody, welcome to content routing work group number 17. As always, we've got our agenda, which I'll drop in the notes. And let me share my screen. Which desktop do we have here? Let me drop the link in the chat and we can get started. Um, all right, so uh, as usual, uh, for anybody checking in here that's not familiar with this work group, uh, the scope of this work group, this is the IPFS content routing work group. We cover um, content routing across IPFS and Filecoin kind of bridging across uh, both. Uh, thanks for throwing a link to the uh, last occurrence notes there. That's a, that's a clever idea. I'll keep that one going, Steve. Um, we have a list of links that are a good contextual reading for a lot of the content routing oriented decisions that we're currently at. Um, and we start every week with an update from the contributing teams uh, that participate and make up this work group. Uh, I'll go ahead and start with the IPNI team updates, and then we can pass it off to either ProBlab, Bifrost, or the IPFS team. So uh, over the course of the last two weeks, um, the IPNI team hosted a operators work group. And so what this is for everybody on the call is that um, the IPNI implementation of SID.contact is the primary implementation, which is hosted by Protocol Labs. It's the backbone of lookups for the network, I would say, at least in the sense that uh, it's the reliable source that you can always go to that um, has now the majority of the network, uh, at least well over half uh, look able to be looked up on. Um, if um, you were to go to SID.contact, it's one implementation. And so we have operators who are uh, volunteers, uh, mostly Filecoin storage providers, who uh, are attempting to help us um, distribute that network of lookups. And so they are running their own instances of uh, the IPNI. And they're publicly accessible. You can perform lookups on them. However, um, we have seven of those currently. Uh, we have uh, a few parties that are interested in potentially also joining the crew and starting to host their own IPNI implementation. So this work group is an opportunity for them to kind of learn more about uh, operating IPNI and also for this community of operators to give us feedback about uh, issues they're having with the implementation they're running or um, to get advice or to understand what the roadmap is and where we're going with this thing so that they can kind of find out about, you know, what future implementations might have or the work that the team has done. And so the summary of feedback from that group is the majority of these operators are running on very old implementations. Um, so old that I would probably call them antiquated. Uh, and uh, the feedback that we kind of arrived at with this work group is that uh, we're gonna try to get the majority of them updated to the new version that's the stable uh, version presently running uh, on SID.contact, um, which is backed by PebbleDB. And so uh, all these folks are going to start the process of kind of scrapping their old implementations and starting anew with a fresh handy dandy uh, CLI that they can use. They're excited about it. Uh, within that group, we have some opportunities that we're gonna take advantage of, which is uh, we wanted to test a bare metal implementation of the IPNI, uh, but we don't necessarily wanna run it ourselves because <laughs> we're already running one and we don't wanna uh, provide this kind of support to the whole network. We want the community to take ownership. Um, so we have two uh, interested parties that are potentially going to set up bare metal instances, and uh, we're kind of working with them to understand, you know, what the scope of the hardware is that they allocate for this and the constraints that they um, leverage. And ultimately, we'd like to understand the cost because we believe that running a bare metal implementation of the IPNI should be pretty inexpensive. 
And that's a good business case to get more people on board, start uh, distributing lookups across the network. And the other thing that came out of this was um, that um, we're going to use our car mirror to get at least one of these partners um, synced up with the current state of SID.contact. So that means uh, to help, help them ingest all of the advertisements up to the current ones made so that as they're going through the ingestion process, uh, they have, uh, it's a little bit nuanced of a term, but I'm just gonna use it for the sake of everyone here that they have the whole network so that you could look anything up uh, on, on their implementation. Uh, that means they'll be caught up with us. Uh, and so that means that you, you should theoretically be able to as reliably uh, get results to your queries of where to find um, SIDS off of their implementation as ours. Um, that's the goal at least. Um, we'll, we'll see how that works in practice, but um, we're also working on deploying uh, IP and I sync, which is pretty exciting. Um, it's it's something that the team has wanted to do for a long time, and we finally managed to get it to the top of our uh, priority list. Um, and this is a um, the advertisement protocol that uh, we use to get advertisements from providers. And so. Um, I put a link to the doc there. I know uh, a number of you had uh, mentioned that you were really curious to see how we were going about it. Uh, please feel welcome to go read that. Uh, Andrew put it together, did an exceptional job. Uh, this is really well thought through. And uh, the way this will execute is that we will uh, kind of write this protocol and then we will deploy it via the provider in Boost. So. Um, there will be an update that goes to Boost that will be a uh, updated provider, which includes this new IP and I sync protocol. Uh, and that will uh, enable us to get away from solely um, receiving our, our advertisement syncs via graph sync. We can now um, get them via HTTP. And then um, we have kind of an ongoing uh, wrestling match uh, with IP and I. People outside of the team probably don't notice too much because it's designed so redundantly that uh, it maintains 100% uptime. But much to the credit of the team, uh, we're actually running a lot of parallel infrastructure and we're constantly right-sizing it to ensure that we're maintaining a, a minimal cost in relation to a um, reliable operation. And uh, so we're always kind of working continuously on setting alerts up around some of our DBs so that we can more easily recognize uh, when we've kind of grown beyond the, uh, what, what's the saying, uh, when your legs are too long for your rug. <laughs> but uh, we're, we're kind of constantly wrestling with that to increase our stability, which is one of our primary goals this quarter. So that's the IP and I team's kind of present two weeks in a nutshell. Um, I'd love to pass it on to either IPFS or ProBlab. Yeah, I can, I'm happy to go uh, as representative for ProBlab and then maybe I'll let, I know Lytle has been filling in for IPFS. Uh, so this isn't full coverage of, uh, for ProBlab, but just a couple of things wanted to share. You know, I think because people are wearing this working group, ProBlab team has kind of been taking on the maintainership mantle for the Go-based Kademlia DHT. Um, implementation, you know, they've been working on that for quite a while to figure out what to do, how to refactor, and where to go. Um, you know, there's been presentations at IPFS thing, you know, inset reps, et cetera, about this, but I don't think we had, we hadn't really put together a coherent story of this is what we're doing and why and where we're going, um, especially since this is turning out to be a pretty sizable amount of work. Um, so a, a draft document of a, a blog post was put together. Um, I've linked to it there. I guess it's not fully public uh, yet, um, but I think anyone on this call should be able to click into it. Uh, and we got that reviewed with Juan yesterday and got some feedback that we need to incorporate either in terms of some of the well, some of the bigger item things is like, are, how are we thinking beyond Kademlia in terms of DHTs? Is there really a market? Um, not just, uh, if is there a market for a more base DHT that's focused on peer routing, not content routing, but to help all of Web3 
you know, it sounds good on paper, but would, would others really adopt it? Um, so there's some product work there and some feedback around, you know, we've been using the term composable um, DHT, but, you know, some worry that we're thinking about like composability within a Kademlia context and that the, you know, were kind of squatting on terms that maybe would imply a, a larger degree of composability than what the work we're actually doing. Um, so either need to, you know, think think bigger in in scope or you know maybe use more precise language so point is there's some feedback work we need to incorporate um before that's ready to go out for the community but i i guess just pointing this all out here that that's that's there it's not fully polished but well people are certainly welcome to look at it and and give any comments um and that we, like we are aware that we aren't communicating the best outward publicly and we're working on it and here's here's where it's happening um so that's that again I, there's no i don't think any probe lab team members here to speak directly to some of the work that's been going on i'm not super, i haven't been super close to it uh but i did link to their project board which i know they've been keeping updated as to all the specific tasks that they're doing um and those they have there is some good project management there in terms of linking to some milestones which list out all the child tasks so if you're you're curious about the specific refactor work that's going on in the uh, go DHT land, um, that's the place to find it. Thanks. Thanks, Steve. Lilo, did you want to give us an IPFS update, sir? Yeah, a very short one, but uh, there's a work in progress on um, exposing Routing V1 uh, server endpoint um, in Kubo as an option for people. This will be an opt-in. Uh, IPNS uh, one is in the review. That one is fairly simple because we already had the IP uh, figured out. Uh, the pyroting one uh, is uh, in review, both uh, IP and, and box implementation. Uh, and I mentioned this because we have at least two browser related projects which would uh, like to use uh, HTTP based stable API for. Uh, all the routing needs. Uh, so uh, collapsing the complexities related to IPNI or DHT into a single uh, API call. Uh, and then using that for discovering other trustless gateways. Uh, so this is like a one thing that will unblock multiple uh, work streams uh, in uh, projects in ecosystem. And in the meantime, while we are waiting for uh, routing v1 IPNS uh, endpoint to exist, uh, we already have uh, delegate uh, nodes used by legacy JSAPFS. So the idea here is to uh, enable uh, trustless uh, IPNS uh, lookups through through existing uh, trustless gateway API that we have. Uh, and I mention it here because this is part of our paying off technical debt, uh, namely removing uh, Kubo RPC from uh, places where the, for, for from like a public use, uh, Kubo RPC was never designed to be exposed on the internet. It it does not support HTTP caching. Uh, it's uh, tied to a specific implementation. So we want to remove use of Kubo RPC, and this will let us do that without waiting for things like routing v1 uh, existing in the wild. Probably uh, we will expose routing v1 once it is in Kubo, but for now we want to uh, enable uh, implementations like uh, RIA and Saturn to not rely on Kubo RPC and use this one. Um, yep, that's the update. Thanks, Lila. That's great. Uh, there, there. I guess we we need some Bifrost engagement on that last point, right? And I guess have you already gotten it? Yeah, I mean, okay. uh, it's waiting for a review. Uh, the good news is that it's already running a version of Kubo that supports this. So it's just a configuration uh, change in Nginx. Cool, thanks. I, I guess, I, was this, is this on Bifrost radar? Any, any questions about it here? Not for the moment. I'm a bit out of the loop. I have to catch up. Sorry. Okay, no problem. Uh, while we're on the subject of Bifrost, does anybody from Bifrost wanna wanna give an update to the team? 
So just uh, uh, we did we haven't rolled out zero twenty one uh, because of the bug that was reported. There was a bug that was reported on Slack, and I have lost that thread. Uh, so we were waiting for either zero twenty one one or zero twenty two to come out with that bug fix. But there was a bug that uh, I remember that Adin pinged us, but I don't remember where. And I'm trying to find the comment from this George. is the underscore redirect thing behavior. Uh, yes, that is that's it. That's it exactly. The underscore redirect thing. So we were holding on until that was fixed. Okay. Uh, got it. Yeah, yeah. I know that's been fixed in main or your or master. Uh, and you know, it's going out in the zero twenty two. Release. I haven't actually checked in if the, the 022 release is supposed to happen today. I don't know if it already has or not. Um, but that. Okay. But also the 211, which would also fix the RSA thing that just came out, maybe. Yeah, I think it, it was intended. Yeah, that, that's true. We we did say that that was in scope to be added there as well. Um, so I, I haven't checked in on what releases happened today. Um, so I guess either one of those should work for you as soon as they come out. And okay. I'll go look at it right now. The other the other thing is uh, there was this uh, ticket opened by Lytle on about IPIP three fifty one on the delegates about supporting uh, IPNS record on the delegates. My main issue with that is that the preloaders are fairly loaded, so I'm wondering how much more load this will place on the preloaders. Perhaps we will need to scale them up. Or uh, add more, or just add more nodes. If we, if this is really needed, not do it on the preloaders. Do it in separate nodes. It will be no because... new load. It will be the same. It, it will be the same request. You, like entire RIA sends the request to you already. The only difference will oh. be will be using API, which now can be cached. So effectively, you will be oh, able to like, okay, cache it okay. for a while, and the load will go down. So yeah, that's the entire. Okay, I thought it. I thought it was like a completely new, uh, no, no, no. completely new functionality here. No. I'll comment on the issue. So. <laughs> yes. Thank you very much. Uh, so yeah, that's about it right now. I think. Cool. That's good feedback. And uh, I didn't, I usually check the dashboard before this meeting. Um, has anybody else checked it in like the last week? Are we, are we up on our like telemetry or our metrics from Bifrost now? Or we're pending being able to be fully up to date with the whole cluster until I think this V21 or V22 um, update goes out. Is that right? Okay, let me just clarify here. Cool, we'll check back in on that. Um, so um, it looks like uh, I, I've been stirring this subject up a bit, I think. Um, mostly just to have people thinking about it and kind of keep it top of mind for folks, but now that we've had our operators work group and we've kind of got volunteers itching to update, um, one thing that I've kind of kept bringing up is this like uh, ambient uh, discovery, and that I think it's it hasn't been a burning priority, um, but I think it won't be a burning priority up until suddenly it is. And um, I think the point in time that we've been indexing on is uh, when we have multiple instances of IPNI that are caught up. Um, especially if one of those instances is operated by somebody other than protocol labs. That's uh, a big opportunity for us to um, kind of start distributing traffic and take advantage of it. We had discussed in the content routing work group uh, a while ago that uh, one way we might go about this is uh, just to um, incorporate the ability to potentially hard code like multiple uh, IP or instances of uh, IPNI so that um, we could delegate traffic between them for testing as kind of like a, a starting iteration um, and then um, work on the bigger problem of um, reputation across these implementations and how we might route traffic across them as 
uh, like a, a much uh, bigger, more complicated work stream that we, um, you know, dedicate some uh, serious planning to. Um, does everybody still feel like that's potentially like a good approach to this problem? And uh, secondarily, the topic we should talk about is where this fits into all of our other priorities, uh, because obviously everybody's pretty maxed out. <laughs> so uh, we have to respect the the time that everyone has. Um, and uh, whether or not, uh, you know, we need to uh, kind of hang back on this a little bit or, or whether or not that's even appropriate, because this is, um, in my opinion, but probably I want to make sure there's a shared opinion across this group uh, that this is a really important milestone for starting to distribute and decentralize this traffic more. Um, so point of topic first. Yep. strategy of approaching this problem uh, or potentially we want to talk about whether or not prioritization is uh, effective but one of those two things I think is what we should lead with yes yeah, so, uh, make makes sense Torfin so I, I put some thoughts down in that document feel free to click into it um, so I think yes important to have resiliency here right of you know not having a single endpoint that if it, if it goes down, uh, people lose access to these records. Uh, so it's I, I think from an IPFS stewards regard, absolutely want to support being able to, or, you know, what, we'll, we'll prioritize enabling uh, multiple uh, endpoints. Um, it's okay. So that I think that I do think that's important to do. Uh, you know, from looking at the ambient discovery protocol, like the like I think it was phase zero of it. Right, you have to figure out great you now you're given a list of potential endpoints you have to figure out which ones to use and there is some basically client side logic that has got to figure that out um obviously you the protocol can be nice in that you can be getting information from other peers to help you figure that out um but ultimately like a client has to make that decision and it's probably going to do some of its own uh instrumenting and ex, you know quote experimenting to figure out hey given this set what should i you know what decision should i make for myself um, and so I guess what I'm advocating for here is let's let's not worry about the protocol aspect for now. Let's you know, let's we can add in the three additional uh, IPNI instances. So and now we've got client code that is given a set of let's say four IPNI instances, and then it has to make a decision as to who it calls when. Um, and we can do all of that. Ex uh, we can you know, we can do some designing there and code writing and experimenting without like trying to bake this into a protocol uh yet and uh that you know that that to me seems like one of the key parts of this equation that at least moves us forward and it gets us having some uh resiliency i think my, my only requirement in this is that we wouldn't by default be shotgunning and hitting all instances all the time um you know we would we would want to get it to a uh so if, i guess if you go down to requirements uh it was where you are right like steady state sorry you scroll up a little bit um right steady state we shouldn't be making extra queries um but if we have to if we so like we should be trying to get some information as to who's the best to call um but if that particular endpoint um fails that fallback queries are for reliability is totally fine and that we've got metrics around who we who we call like some maybe there's maybe there's some additional requirements beyond this but these are some of the key things that i think we would want to have um, and then a you know a design could be put together. Uh, so I think from an IPFS stewards regard, we are absolutely game to help further flush out the requirements, review the design, review any implementation work that happens in Boxo and Kubo, and then do the relevant releases, and then ultimately like long term own this uh, own this code. But that that to me seemed like the sweet spot of moving this forward in terms of getting us some of the resiliency we want, allowing other parties to play while also not um, taking on too big of an effort, given all that both teams are trying to do. Um, so that, that that's kind of where I've, you know, my, my thought are landing, and that's mostly what's encapsulated in this document, but feedback welcome. That feels like an ideal outcome. I'd love to hear um, Will Mossy if, if that sounds like a good path to take. I feel like that's forward progress. Makes sense to me, Steve. Likewise, I agree. I think this also maybe uh, feels aligned with what the next conversation will be of what Spark is asking for IPNI. I think there's uh, 
parallel work that we'll see as pretty complementary here that IPNI is likely to want to want uh, continue on. Uh, and so I can talk through that if you want to in now, or we can continue, uh, or we can finish off on this one. I I think um, Steve, we should have the the folks from this work group uh, read through the document. This is really well put together, and it gives us something to kind of think about. Um, also, it, it definitely like respects the goal that we're trying to hit. So I think probably we'll find close alignment uh, once everybody's reviewed it. This is great. Thank you oh, for putting yeah. it together. Yep, yeah, you bet. No problem. Um, does that make sense, Will? And uh, then we can kind of discuss the Spark. Cool. So let me give a one minute description of what Spark is doing here. And then they're interested in making use of content routing as we have it uh, to accomplish part of what they're doing. Um, Spark is a system that is getting built by the Filecoin station team as a way of tracking how well retrievals work on Filecoin. Uh, so they want to have a distributed set of desktop users who get tasks of attempt to get data from uh, you know, provider that then try and do that and then report uh, if they were successful or not. Uh, and they're working on a, a protocol that involves uh, only minimal cryptography uh, for uh, what sort of looks like a commit reveal protocol where a, a group of these desktop users will attempt to get some content. And then once all of their uh, successes are, are revealed, you can uh, come to some conclusions about whether this provider seems to actually be providing this content uh, or not. One of the key inputs to such a system is what content uh, and who has it. Uh, and so it's this content routing problem that we find ourselves in. What, what should we be testing? Um, and rather than have these desktop uh, clients have to somehow get to a consensus themselves on uh, content that exists and crawl the Filecoin uh, blockchain state tree to find deals and so forth. It seems that some of that already exists in things like IPNI. And so there's a desire to make use of that existing uh, index of what content is available. The main method that they're looking for and hope could be added as a feature uh, to something like IPNI is this first method that I wrote down, which is get random multi-hash uh, of a deal. So they would walk the state tree to find valid deals. Uh, and so they'd have a sense of what the deals are, but they'd want to be able to ask for some hash that appears in under that context ID. Uh, and, and given a seed, they'd want to get a random one. This then plays on a couple of the uh, security things that don't really, that haven't been fully fleshed out in IPNI. I think there's stories for many of these, but like the questions around ambient discovery and having resilience, this, this leads to a bunch of questions about, well, what happens if IPNI misbehaves? Um, and so one of the things that would be nice is if there are multiple instances of IPNI, then these clients can actually just make that same request against the different IPNI instances and make sure they get the same deterministic outcome and that gives them some sense that the calculation is being done correctly and saves a desktop client from having to get hundreds of megabytes of SIDS and do that walk itself. Um, so so there, there's some consensus type thing of like, if we have a federation of these indexers, that, that gives us some ability to, to get to confidence that we're actually getting a good answer of some task to do without having to do all that work ourselves. However, it does mean that we need some way to now say, well, this node isn't behaving correctly. So how do I challenge and say this IPNI node is misbehaving and is not doing it? Um, so one thing we can do is we can have statements from IPNI be uh, authenticated that they can have a signature. And so now it's you know disputable that that there there is an attestation that this is the right answer. And I can say, well, I downloaded the data and did that computation myself and it's different. And so that means you did it incorrectly. And so you're acting improperly and I would like to punish you. We don't really have a way to talk about uh, bad behavior from an IPNI. And I think a story about what it means if one of these IPNI providers is bad that we can describe more formally would be really useful. Should an IPNI operator need to stake coins that can get slashed if they aren't giving correct answers? Is there some other thing where they fall out of the consensus of allowed uh, IPNI instances that queries get made of? Are there other games that should be part of this protocol? to ensure that we're getting good results out of IPNI operators. 
So there's there's security of IPNI that we can talk about in this context, and we can think about what various scopes of that we think is in scope right now. There's a second one, which is how do we know that the content that's being advertised to IPNI by a provider is actually the right content? And this is one, this is a problem we already have today. There are plenty of storage providers that advertise a lot of SIDS, but don't actually provide that content. How do we make sure that we only have accurate content in the indexes that we're returning to clients? And again, this is a this is an index quality question. Um, if, if a provider lies or, and just says, well, great, I've got one deal that I have available. So every time I get a deal, what I'm gonna tell IPNI is that deal also contains this set of SIDS that I have unsealed that I'm gonna be the ones that I do retrieval on, then it'll only get tested on the set of SIDS it's chosen. So is there a way to dispute and say, actually for this deal, I've downloaded the contents and it doesn't match what you're claiming the SIDS are in there. This provider either is not actually making available or the underlying deal doesn't match what they're claiming the SIDS are uh, when they've indexed it. Uh, how, how do we go about challenging and potentially delisting a provider as having bad information? Uh, we don't have a mechanism for a client to dispute a provider as not providing correct information right now. Um, we have some not super well codified uh, descriptions of if we can't reach a provider for a while, we'll delist them because we think we can't contact them as an IPNI instance. Um, but but formalizing uh, what bad behavior looks like from both providers and from IPNI instances are going to be uh, part of the story that a successful Spark uh, system is going to need to have answers for. So. Um, we, we should think about what all needs to happen there, um, but there, there's a set of hardening that we should be thinking about uh, around IPNI and content routing in general. I think that's useful for all clients, but it's particularly useful if we have an incentivized mechanism that's making use of this system. Question for real, please. You mentioned um, a seed to select multi-ashes. What's the rationale for the seed? Um, the, the seed is that uh, you, you would like over time, if I sample a deal, to get to be sampling different SIDs out of that deal. So rather than just like the first thing in it, I'd like to be trying different things. And so we would use something like a DRAND value or the APOC or something else as a seed that changes over time to ask for different random SIDs, but a deterministic different random SID. Gotcha. Thank you. Uh, a ba ba basic question here uh will the sorry yeah it's probably obvious i mean you said that spark's already going to be or station seven's already going to be walking um the state tree i guess uh why bring ip and i into the loop um like can it not infer some of this information already directly potentially i mean i think if we were thinking about complexity and what complexity a desktop user would be will able to handle versus what complexity we could offload. Um, the, the process there between what's in this state tree or list of active deals and finding a SID involves contacting that storage provider's index provider endpoint potentially is one path. And so then you've got, is it active? Is it available to everyone? Do we have availability of this advertisement? Because then you, you Right, IPNI gives us sort of full availability in some sense, or or we we can get to the illusion that the different clients probably can all access some IPNI instance that are in consensus, as opposed to what happens if the SP provides its index in different ways or only uh, answers on this index uh, selection process to some of the clients they're supposed to be measuring it, so they don't get to a consensus. Um, but then needs to download the correct advertisement. Still has the problems of the SP potentially not having provided the correct uh, set of SIDs for that advertisement if they go with an index provider listing of the SP's variant of what is in the payload or needs to download either all 32 gigs, which is now a very large ask, uh, or gets an unverified subset, needs to potentially guess if there are SIDs in there through a set of heuristics and then see if it can get a SID out of a random read that may be verified. That whole set of things seemed like more work potentially than being able to abstract that to something like IPNI and then make use of IPNI. Got it. Th it seemed like a lot of work either way. Yeah, yeah. We've yeah. already got some of it in IPNI. Maybe we can make use of that to decouple. I see. Cool. Thanks for explaining.
yeah, Masi. Another question, please. Do you think we need a reverse index of uh, PCID to uh, list of SITs in IPNI? Because right now it, it's kind of undocumented that Lotus so happens to use the context ID as PCID. Um, right, so so this is, if, if we can do that as an intermediate step, uh, rather than providing this direct, uh, give me a random one in the context ID by uh, with a seed, that could be a reasonable intermediate. The the downside there, right, is that that list of uh, multi hashes in one deal, it can be order of 100 megs of data, right? So you're asking the client to do quite a bit more uh, network download uh, if if you're providing it at that layer and you've still got the question, you, you've still got uh, to solve both of the challenging uh, edges, right? Which is you still can, you still have to figure out both is the index provider providing the correct list uh, and has the SP provided the correct source data. Follow-up question about the seed thing again. It, it, should the seed be globally deterministic or within a single IPNI instance? Uh, globally. Because mm -hmm. you want to get the you want to get agreement across your different IPNI instances that you query for this. Because if I if I query the multiple different IPNI databases and they give me back the same resulting multi-hash, then I just sort of am like, great, cool, I got agreement. The database is consistent. I'm going to go try this as my outcome SID that I need to test for this round. Yeah, uh, I'm thinking because it also means guaranteed eventual consistency between indexers, which is a bigger on problem. a deal. And and then the other part, right, is like for these deals that represent a Filecoin deal, or or for these uh, context IDs and advertisements, we don't expect them to update. And and even the fact that a storage provider is updating what SIDs it's claiming exist in a static Filecoin deal can be then uh, like that's a signed statement of it making mutable a thing that is clearly not mutable on disk. And we can turn that into at least Spark punishing them, uh, their, rem their reputation for doing that. So uh, inconsistencies there due to them updating anything other than a single advertisement about this context ID. Uh, there, there's this all, there's this other way that we can do fraud detection there. Right. I guess the, the cases that I was thinking about was more um, a deal getting slashed, a removal happens, but the removal and is it's not seen or something. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, we can talk about those offline. Thanks, Will. Yeah, I think both of these topics are going to take a little bit of thinking and reading. Um, yep. Will, is there is there any documentation around um, kind of the the Spark um, kind of goals for probably not like this aspect of Spark yet, right? Like this is pretty pretty early. Okay, this is the ideation phase stuff. Um, okay, I think this is there's a lot of good stuff to think about for the team. Um, Maybe what our goal is is to kind of uh, ponder these and how we would approach them and uh, take the feedback asynchronously from this meeting. Yep, I think that's right. I don't think there's an immediate action, but I think it is how how do what needs to happen to IPNI to make it be useful in cases that are incentivized and that you, we need to think about the potential uh, adversarial behavior that participants can have. That that we have a system that works well in the optimistic, non-incentivized case, um, but there is a bunch of hardening uh, that, that needs to exist if we're able to support cases like these. Um, in doing that hardening, we also provide additional safety for uh, our normal clients. So it, it's worth doing as well, but uh, it, it, I think this is a useful thought exercise, if nothing else, for what, what are the various pieces that need to go into place to make us feel like this is a system that we would use in incentivized situations. I guess on top of this, there, there's kind of like a a performance impact like relative to this work that we would do because we'll be like generating traffic. Are there like boundaries that we should be thinking within regarding like what performance impact would be associated with 
like implementing this new traffic paradigm or or is your question how many lookups will come to ipni as a result of this yeah uh well that and i guess for the desktop clients we're we're kind of we're assuming that it's okay to like distribute effort to desktop clients because they're participating so i'm just wondering if there's like um if there's traffic patterns that we should be uh, like attempting to accomplish or that we should be focused on like minimizing this in a particular area of the network um as we think through this i think the target is that uh retrieval validations are aiming for something on the order of five percent of total retrievals uh so you can think of maybe an additional five percent load uh of, of of accesses to ipni as a result of this system that's a good like easy target to, to kind of think about Cool. Awesome. We'll see how much of this we get done. I think the 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 hope for Spark is that they'll have prototypes and, and start having things happen uh, before too long. I don't think all of these adversarial cases need to be locked down immediately. I think the, the path towards real uh, significant uh, incentivization coming through Spark is going to take a little bit longer than you know a working system. Um, but as that as part of the in growing incentivization, there will become increasing pressure to uh, have answers for some of these various attacks. Makes sense. Um, There's a lot to think about. This is good stuff. Um, did anybody else have anything they wanted to cover while we're here? I feel like we've gotten a lot to think about. <laughs> All right. This is good. Uh, very productive stuff. Uh, I'm always happy if I can uh, give you all some time back <laughs> because it's so fleeting. Uh, but thanks everyone for joining the content routing work group today. Super constructive session. I hope everyone has a great end or start of their day. Take care, y'all.